when all things were in quiet silence and night was in the midst of her swift course, thine almighty word, O Lord, leaped down from heaven out of thy royal throne. The Lord is king and hath put on glorious apparel. The Lord hath put on his apparel and girded himself with strength. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. When all things were in quiet silence and night was in the midst of her swift, swift course, thine almighty word, O Lord, leaped down from heaven out of thy royal throne. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high and on earth. Peace, goodwill towards men. We praise Thee, we bless Thee, we worship Thee, we glorify Thee, we give thanks to Thee for Thy great glory. O Lord God, Heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who hast poured upon us the light of thine incarnate word, grant that the same light enkindled in our hearts may shine forth in our lives. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of the lessons. Our first lesson is from Isaiah. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up from before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. The word of the Lord. We will recite Psalm 147 in alternating verses. Hallelujah. How good it is to praise, to sing praises to our God. How pleasant it is to honor him with praise. Praise. 
He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. There is no limit to his wisdom. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God upon the harp. He makes grass to grow under the mountains and green plants to serve mankind. He is not impressed by the might of a horse. He has no pleasure in the strength of a man. Worship the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. He has established peace on his, your borders. He satisfies you with the finest wheat. He gives snow like wool. He scatters hoarfrost like ashes. He sends forth his word and melts them. He blows with his wind and the waters flow. <clears throat> he has not done so to any other nation. To them he has not revealed his judgments. Hallelujah. The epistle lesson is from Galatians. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive the adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, 
he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received, grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. The Gospel of the Lord. I speak and we all hear by the grace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, dear friends, it has been a week of gifts, getting them, giving them, exchanging them, figuring out what we're going to do with them, figuring out where to put them. In my case, I, I, I am quick to clear things out of the living room because I want it to be back like it was before, and yet I have to put the stuff somewhere, and now there's a pile somewhere else I've got to deal with. And if I'm real, realistic, there are two or three piles around my house I've got to do something with. And some of them are things that are going to sit there for a while. I will confess there are Christmas gifts I've received in past years that continue to sit wherever I put them because I haven't figured out what to do with them yet. I mean, there are those that we get that we know immediately, I'm going to put this into use. I know exactly what to do with it, and, and there's no question. There are others that are plainly going to be in the regifting category, and they go immediately to wherever I put regifting stuff until I find somebody else to give it to. There are some that are the big ticket items that, that we remember from one year to the next that we received. There are the, the white elephants and the, the, the gag gifts. It, it's a shame that it was only this week that I discovered a website called the Meow Library. Have you heard of this? I see one nod. I, I, I wish I knew about this because I would have given this as a gift. These are real paperback books of famous classics that have been translated for the benefit of your cat. And so, for instance, War and Peace, which you can buy for like 25 bucks, is 750 pages in which the word meow is written 400,000 times. I would have given this to my sister. I only wish they would make something in the, 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 the Jane Austen family because that's what she's really big on. I would give her Pride and Prejudice translated for your cat. Had I only known... These gifts that we receive, sometimes we have no idea what to make of them. In that case, I would definitely not know what to make of it. But many times, it takes a while to figure out what the gift was for. There are things that you look at it and you think, well, okay, I'll use that later. And then six months later, you come back to it and say, oh, now I know what this is for. Suddenly, things become useful to you only with time and with looking for the right occasion to put them into use. And so sometimes it's a matter of trusting that the gift will eventually be something that we find valuable. Writing those thank you notes, that in a way, is a way of beginning to say, okay, I know I'm going to find this to be of use to me in some way. That, I think, is where we find ourselves a week after Christmas back in church. We know that we receive a gift from God every time we come here. We know that we receive a gift from God, particularly on Christmas, the gift of the presence of God among us in the form of Jesus. And I'm reminded in that context that my father thought it was funny year after year to tell us he was giving us the cat as a Christmas present. Yes, we know we receive Jesus again and again from God. And it's important not to underestimate that gift. But I think there's some other hidden gifts that come at this time of the year that are just as important to remember and to pay attention to. There's a hint about one of those hidden in the lesson, the first lesson we heard read this morning. Is I will give you a new name. I think there are examples as we go through this season of ways in which we are given new names that we shouldn't overlook because they are ones that we perhaps will need to pick up again in the year to come as our circumstances change, as the world comes back into our lives in one way or another, and we're trying to figure out what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus. So 
I want to point out a few of these to you that came up in the past week and a half while we were all busy doing other things that perhaps we should not overlook as we collect our gifts at the end of this season and move back into what passes for regular life as faithful followers of Jesus. The first happened before Christmas. It was the, the Feast of St. Thomas, our own namesake. And you may know that the reason why we celebrated it the way we did with Indian food and, and dancing and music and everything else was to recall the fact that by tradition, St. Thomas went to India as an apostle. You may wonder why it is that on some representations of St. Thomas's symbols, we see the builder's square. We know that the spear is for his martyrdom, but the builder's square reminds us that by tradition, when he was in India, he was asked by a ruler whom he met there to build a church, a, a literal building of a church. This man who had been a, a, a hick from Galilee, who probably was a fisherman or a, a, a farmer or a small businessman of some kind, probably didn't have any idea that he would eventually be called in a far distant place to build a building and in the process to build a church. And yet that was the new name that he received, Builder. He's remembered in that way to this day, St. Thomas the Builder. It's a better name than St. Thomas the Doubting One, surely. Then a few days pass in Christmas time. So you have a moment of pity for the saints whose day falls on the 22nd, 23rd, or 24th of December. They tend not to get a whole lot of notice. Christmas comes and goes, and the 26th arrives, and we have St. Stephen, the first martyr of the church. Stephen, who was among the first deacons, these people who were called to be waiters, literally, to serve at tables, because the immediate followers of Jesus realized they didn't have the time to do that and everything else they were supposed to do. Now, we know that, Tom, that, that, that Stephen did more than that. It's recorded in Acts that he was preaching and he was doing miracles and doing other things. And chances are, even for those who were not doing those things, the job was more complicated. And they really were probably more like social workers, taking care of the needs of the poor and those who had no one to take care of them in a variety of ways. The thing to notice about Stephen is that I think that if he and his colleagues had just done that, if they had just continued to feed people and to look after the needs of widows and orphans and to do those other sort of social things and had been quiet about why it was they were doing it, I think the world would have been okay with that. Where Stephen got himself into trouble, I think where many of us get ourselves into trouble, is when we are explicit and out there in public about the why of what it is that we're doing. Stephen was martyred when he made it clear that the reason for taking care of the people, the reason for meeting the physical needs of people was because the vision of the glory of God was to be seen in that taking care of people and even more so in the faces of those people themselves. And at that point, the world realized where it was falling short. The world realized how much it was ignoring the glory of God, how much it was defacing the glory of God by not recognizing and trying to meet those needs. And it was in that moment that Stephen was silenced. And yet, what we remember Stephen for is that proclamation that one who had discovered the presence of God in a very ordinary and basic everyday kind of way by serving those who were beloved of God, proclaimed what he had discovered, what he had found in that, the vision that he had of the presence of God. And so he is known as a proclaimer of the faith, one who would not keep silent. Then we come to the 27th the feast of St. John the Evangelist, one who was, by tradition, beloved of Jesus, a very close follower of Jesus, 
one of a small number of people who went almost everywhere with him, who saw everything that he did, who had a particular insight into what his mission was. I mean, not always perfect, because James and John, you recall, go to Jesus and say, give us a good place in heaven. And Jesus says, well, you're asking an awful lot. Are you sure you can handle that? And they say, yes. And in fact, they end up following through on that. James is martyred. John is not. But John has what in some older traditions of the church is called martyrdom in intent, but not in deed. He ends up as a hermit living in exile. But it's in that exile that he has yet another vision of the glory of God, as is recorded in the book of Revelation. You remember how it begins, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Somehow, whatever it was that John received in his time with Jesus and his time as a Christian after the ministry of Jesus enabled him to be in the Spirit in some deep and powerful way and to draw from it an image that we find strange now because it, it, it's so extreme in it, it, its descriptions of what he saw, but was intended to be a message of comfort, a message of assurance that in the end, God wins. Somehow in this, this, this mystical vision that John has, he's able to see the end of all things. And so he is remembered as a mystic, one who was able to see what it is that God intends in a way that is perhaps veiled for many of us. Then we come to the next day, which is the Feast of the Holy Innocents. We remember that after the birth of Jesus, the political authorities in that part of the world got worried. A king had been born. Well, somebody else already called himself king. He needed to worry about this person who might come up and be a rival for his power, one who already had a pretty tenuous hold on power, the Hasmoneans, the, the, the house of the kings of, of, of Judah who had been put there and kept there by the Romans because it was convenient, but who lived fairly dissolute lives as we discover elsewhere in the Gospels. So how did the world in the form of the king respond? by killing all the children who might be of the right sex and the right age to be the one who had been born, whose birth had been predicted. Now, those very young children were not really in a position to have witnessed much for their faith. And yet, in some ways, they were witnesses to what it is that God is doing and the way the world pushes back against what it is that God does an odd way of thinking about it. There, there, in the 1970s, there was a comedy cop show called Barney Miller. You remember this? There's one episode that I remember in particular where there's been some incident and a bunch of people who were witnesses to that incident come to the police station to make statements. And the comedy revolves around the fact that these people have all of these oddities and all the, the weirdnesses of their lives and they're not all of them very nice people and they're not really concentrating on what they're supposed to be doing, and yet they are witnesses. It doesn't matter who they were the moment before the thing happened. The fact that they were present in the thing makes them witnesses to it. And to tie that to yet another cultural reference, there's a song by U2 that has a line in it, their blood still cries from the ground. That witness has not, very little, indeed nothing, to do with what those people chose, those children chose for themselves, what anyone else chose for them. And yet, what happened to them is a witness to us of what the world will do whenever it feels that the power of God may be creeping in around the edges. Carrying on with that theme, the next day is the Feast of St. Thomas of Becket. Beckett, who was a pretty savvy political operator. He was, as a layperson, relatively well politically connected. He did favors for the king. He was a buddy of the king. He went off and did diplomatic missions for the king. 
He did a variety of things to make himself valuable. And so, I suppose, logically, the king thought, well, I'll put this person in an even more powerful position, and because he's my buddy, I'll now have a friend in a position where he can do things for me. So he made him Archbishop of Canterbury. Well, it turned out that once Becket became Archbishop of Canterbury, he suddenly realized what his job was about. Suddenly, he began to think, oh, I should be looking out for the interests of the church. And as disputes arose between the crown and the church, Becket began to take the church's side rather than that of his friend, the king. And in the end, whether directly, indirectly, uh, intentionally, unintentionally, the king brought about his death at the altar in the cathedral, I believe on, on that date, December 29th, soon after Christmas. Becket earned for himself in the process the name converted, the name convicted, the name one who discovers what it is that God truly intends. It's a long name. You can't write it on a check, but you know what I mean. Somehow, by the course of his life, he revealed to us the way that faith can sneak up on us, the way that what it is that we do day by day in our lives of faith will build over time. And eventually, we will wake up one day and discover, oh, I'm actually a faithful person. I actually see what it is God is calling me to do. I am convicted by my faith and compelled to do what it is that I see right here in front of me. It was always there, but now it has been revealed fully. And then the 30th, the 30th or the 31st, depending upon which version of our calendar you look at, there's a woman named Frances Godet who was born in a log cabin in Mississippi in the middle of the 19th century in very humble circumstances. Uh, she grew into a leader of the women's Christian temperance movement. But more than that, she became very interested in the lives of those who were in prison. First, her interest was mainly African-American men in prison and coming out of prison. But over time, she came to be interested in prisons in general and the lives of prisoners and particularly the lives of those who had once been in prison and were now back in society. She worked for their education and for their employment. She worked for their reintegration into society and so gained the title liberator one who recognized the many prisons that we find ourselves in, not just the literal ones, and began to discover ways to break people out of them, finding the keys to the door that unlocked the many prisons that those around her found themselves in. So, many names for Christians right around this time of the year. We also have received new names in 2023. And now as we stand on the threshold of a new year, it's worth asking, what are the new names that God is going to lay on us this year? Perhaps more to the point, what are the names God has already laid on us that we are beginning to discover? worth taking some time in the next few days as we make our New Year's resolutions. Perhaps not to go looking for new names if God hasn't intended them, but perhaps to be more aware of them. Perhaps to dig into the ones God has already given us. Teacher, healer, friend, companion, example, inspiration. These names are already with us. Perhaps we haven't got the wrapping paper off all, off all of them yet, but they'll wait. God is patient. God has plenty of time. And when the time comes, I trust, I pray, I have faith that we will find those gifts we have been given, those names we have been uh, gifted with. We will take them up and use them as our many examples have done in the past. Amen.
Now let us stand and say what we believe in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and with power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and seateth at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets, and I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give us thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to conspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Kevin, our bishop, Howell and Clay and Juan, our priests, and Sheila, our deacon that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, especially Joseph, our president, John, our governor, and the Newark City Council, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoicing in thy whole creation they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the good example of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Thomas, and all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Amen. Ye who do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways. 
draw near with faith and make your humble confession to Almighty God, devoutly kneeling. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. <clears throat> we do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life to the honor and glory of thy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to offer yourselves as a sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God, because thou didst give Jesus Christ, thine only Son, to be born for us, who by the mighty power of the Holy Ghost was made very man of the substance of the Virgin Mary, his mother, 
that we might be delivered from the bondage of sin and receive power to become thy children. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord most high. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to thee, almighty God, our heavenly Father, for that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness, vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits but pardoning our offenses, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Ghost all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world. 
O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank Thee for that Thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of Thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of Thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate in the mystical body of Thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of Thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech Thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with Thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as Thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with Thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Will you please be seated? Once more for 2023, we will offer prayers for birthdays and for anniversaries. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. First, a prayer for birthdays. O God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. On this occasion, that prayer seems to apply to every one of us. And for anniversaries. Gracious God, Father of all, we give you thanks for another year of lives shared in human love and in your love that never fails. Bless these couples in all that is yet to come, confirming and strengthening in them the vows they have made to one another in your name. Keep them faithful until they must part in death and bring them together at last in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. The first is to remind you that there is a, an adult or an all ages really Christian ed program after this service in the parlor. We're going to look at some nativity scenes, paintings, and carvings and so forth and see what maybe artists have been trying to tell us what they were thinking about when they imagined the scene of Jesus' birth. So please come and join us in the parlor this morning at 9 o'clock, 9.05, right after this service. Uh, next Saturday, there will be a dinner for Epiphany. We'll have a potluck dinner. We'll have Compline. And we'll have some return of the burning of the greens. We don't know in exactly what form, uh, but perhaps we'll set something on fire in the parking lot. So come along for all of those things, if any of that appeals to you. Uh, and we will uh, celebrate the, the arrival of the Magi at the manger finally, as they have been making their way up the, the side windowsill here over the last week and a half. They'll finally get there next Saturday. Am I forgetting anything important to be announced? If not, then the Lord be with you. Let us pray. May Almighty God, who sent his Son to take our nature upon him, bless you in this holy season, scatter the darkness of sin, and brighten your heart with the light of his holiness. Amen. May God, who sent his angels to proclaim the glad news of the Savior's birth, fill you with joy and make you heralds of the gospel. Amen. May God, who in the word made flesh, joined heaven to earth and earth to heaven, give you his peace and favor. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia.